Hi! ActiveHistory.ca is happy to feature a recording of The Mosaic vs. The Melting Pot, Myths and Realities of Cultural Pluralism in Canada and the United States. This roundtable brings together five important Canadian and American scholars of migration history to discuss cultural pluralism on both sides of the Canada-US border. This roundtable took place on October 19, 2012 as part of the Borderlands Workshop at Glendon College in Toronto. So welcome to uh, this part of the symposium on borderlands, transnationalism and migration. Um, this afternoon's session is uh, an examination of uh, multiculturalism and uh, uh, melting pot and such ideas uh, in Canadian history and uh, American history. And uh, what I will do is introduce uh, the speakers. Um, I think since there are five speakers, it would be uh, better for me to introduce them individually rather than to go through the whole list and then you'll forget oh, who that was and uh, they'll come and speak and you'll say, who, who was that anyway? So our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Grace Peña Delgado. Uh, who is an assistant professor of history at Penn State University. Um, she's a historian of North American borders. Her first monograph w is entitled uh, Making the Chinese Mexican, Global Migration, Localism and Exclusion in U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, which appeared uh, this year at Stanford. Uh, her second monograph, which is about to appear, is called Sex and State, Citizenship and moral, uh, Morals Policing in America's Early 20th Century Borderlands. When I first began to think about and research the concepts framing this roundtable discussion, the American melting pot and the Canadian mosaic, I began to realize how very powerful and real these concepts are in the making of an American identity, both in the United States and in Canada. The melting pot and mosaic are powerful because they are ideas about history. And additionally, they are powerful ideas because they contain at their core the promise of collective and individual belonging, equal rights, upward economic mobility, and citizenship. Both ideas, however, mandate that fundamental changes in the inner essence of immigrants take place. In the case of the melting pot, complete assimilation is in order. And in addition to this, it is assumed that immigrants will actively guide their own assimilation, that they will learn English, adapt to the regimen of an eight-hour workday, and teach their children American values, and that they do, would do these things without question and without contest. The final outcome of the melting pot will be the so-called real American, a byproduct of the mixing of the best of every ethnic group. The metaphor was first popularized in Israel Zangwill's 1908 play called The Melting Pot. It dramatized how Jewish Americans, immigrants from the old world, became absorbed into American society and changed into true Americans in the new world. On the other hand, the terms of the mosaic metaphor are less severe it allows for acculturation, not full assimilation, at least for the first two generations of immigrants. The mosaic in theory recognizes the richness of racial, racial pluralism and advocates for a multicultural society. Whatever the metaphor, the melting pot or mosaic, both have fallen short and continue to fall short of their promise of inclusion and equality. In the case of Canada, the choices of official multiculturalism have excluded Native peoples, their language, and have marginalized their cultures. Also, Canada has not de dealt head-on with this history of racism and exclusion of Chinese, Japanese, and South Asians. In the same vein, I'm going to turn squarely to the discussion about the melting pot and Arizona's controversial laws, SB 1070, known as Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhoods Act and SB 2281, the so-called ban on ethnic studies. The two laws attest to the betrayal of the melting pot. For Latinos in Arizona, the promise of blending ethnicities has resulted in official policing, 
and intellectual repression. What these two laws also demonstrate is that for Latinos, the line between alien and citizen has become soft. That is, through SB 1070, law enforcement officers can stop any individual that may look illegal and demand that they show documentation to prove their citizenship or immigration status. The law also allows social workers, teachers, and other agents of the state to check on the immigration status of people applying for any public benefit, service, or license. It also requires landlords and business employees to verify the immigration status of any potential denizen or worker. The phrase, show me your papers, has been used frequently to describe how a police officer or an agent of the state might approach someone they suspect as being undocumented. In my estimation, these practices place surveillance, detention, incarceration, and deportation as handmaidens in the policing of Arizona's Latino population while constructing them as alien citizens. Whereas SB 1070 focuses primarily on the ostensible control of bodies, SB 2281 is predominantly about controlling minds. The ban on ethnic studies targets Arizona's Mexican-American primary and secondary school population, roughly students from the ages of 12 to 18. With SB 2281, the attention is not so much to expel or to harass as it is to inculcate a deep-seated second-class citizenship status for Latinos and other people of color to deny them the right to explore their own histories and cultures. It is, in effect, about the eradication of ethnic identity among young people in the state's already floundering school system, which now ranks near the bottom in the nation. HB 2281 makes or barely makes a pretense to hide any of this language in its intended scope. A close reading of the law lays bare some of the more stark and sinister aspects of its potential application in a state where Latino students fill nearly half the seats in the public schools. In particular, there are two primary aspects of the law that indicate an ongoing erasure of ethnic identities and the further marginalization of people of color in Arizona. First, SB, first, SB 2281's Declaration of Policy Preamble, in which the, legislator exp the legislature expresses his intention that pupils should be taught to treat and value each other as individuals and likewise be taught to resent not be taught to resent or hate other races or classes of people. Had a little bit of a slip there. <laughs> Secondly, SB 2281 contains an exemption for teaching students about episodes of genocide, such as the Holocaust. In essence, SB 2281 advocates that students of a particular group be taught about their history of subjugation, but not about the spirit of solidarity. They can focus on their demise, but not their emancipation. In my opinion, this portion of the bill strives to reinforce pain at the expense of pride, encouraging young people to internalize the oppression delivered by the dominant culture and to make it part of their consciousness. In all these ways, SB 2281 is a potent example of legislative bigotry and open persecution of people based on factors such as race and class. As with SB 1070, SB 2281 is also self-violating in that it promotes precisely what it claims to prohibit, namely ethnic chauvinism and resentment toward a race or class of people. I am not sure if we need to forego the melting pot ideal or the mosaic ideal as much as we may need to look at the ways in which scholarship looks at or looks away from current realities. However, we may want to consider more closely the relationship between these pluralist ideals on the one hand and the processes of intellectual repression and deportation, which devalue assimilation, separates families, and reinforces some populations, in this case Latinos, as perpetual alien citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Delgado. Our next speaker uh, will be uh, Patricia Wood, who is uh, Professor of Geography and Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts. And we're very uh, 
thankful that she could take time to come and uh, speak to us today, despite her heavy uh, responsibilities in the Faculty of Arts. Um, Professor Wood uh, is the author of Nationalism from the Margins, Italians in Alberta and British Columbia, which was published uh, in 2002. And uh, she is the co-author with Engen Eisen of Citizenship and Identity, a book that appeared in uh, 1999. Professor Wood. I find this to be a, a very Canadian topic because it's uh, particularly in Canada that we use the terms melting pot and mosaic, uh, increasingly multiculturalism, but we mean roughly the same thing by it, uh, to articulate the difference uh, between a country, the United States, that assimilates all newcomers into a new American identity, and Canada that, well, it depends on the telling, but either accepts everyone as they are, uh, to mean, you know, allows them to maintain their original culture, or it, it accepts a, sort of signals a, a willing segregation, sometimes laments, sometimes laments a lack of unified identity with everyone glued in his or her own spot in the mosaic. Um, and I think this is rooted in, um, well, it, it's a Canadian effort, right, at, at feeling superior. <laughs> um, there's a Schoolhouse Rock short video. I don't know if you're familiar with Schoolhouse Rock. It was a, a program uh, in the United States uh, uh, shown with Saturday morning cartoons that, that gave lessons initially in math, uh, but also moved on to, to history. And there's one on about the great American melting pot. And there's Lady Liberty, the Statue of Liberty animated, brought to life, who has a recipe for a great country where everyone, regardless of their background, melts right in. And it's a great teachable moment. I've, I've used it in the classroom along with a few others from it. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's kind of funny. It's really easy to, to pick apart. Um, and yet this is believed, and I think Grace has spoken to this a little bit too, it is believed, you know, by many Americans and in different ways and for different reasons uh, by many Canadians. And I would agree, it's, it's very much a frame of, these terms are very much a frame of how we understand our history, particularly of migration, but also more broadly about nation building. Um, and yet, as I thought through this, um, even though I was critical, and as I said, I've used these as these teachable moments, I'm actually going to start uh, by defending these terms. Uh, I, I didn't end up where I started, where I thought I would when I when I started out. Um, we know there are oversimplifications, okay, but their origins. Uh, I'm going to start with melting pot, so we'll start with Lady Liberty here. Their, their origins are actually fairly noble and idealistic. I want to reference the same uh, play that Grace mentioned um, because that's when it came into to common usage from the, the play the, the Melting Pot, which dates to 1908, which is significantly by a Jewish immigrant. And if I could just mention a couple details of the story, the, the main character has, has come to the United States having survived a pogrom that eliminated his family. And he is writing an American symphony called the crucible. Uh, out of this faith, right, that it is possible to transcend the kind of ethnic hatred that destroyed, literally destroyed his family and build something, build a new kind of identity that transcends that. And in the story, he then falls in love with the daughter of, of uh, Russian, who's an immigrant as well, and unknowingly, when he falls in love with her, it turns out that her father is the Russian officer responsible for the demise of his family. So horrific. But the play brings that to a happy ending in which there's an apology and a happily ever after that they still make plans to wed. So there's an extraordinary optimism behind the melting pot, literally that's the title of the play. Um, and the origins that precede the use, this is not the first use of the term in 1908, but the origins that precede it are, are equally, um, or the, the examples of it before that, sorry, are equally um, optimistic. Um, one example, I won't, I won't take you through a genealogy, but one example, uh, it goes back to the 1800s, but um, Emerson, Ruf, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson is a, a notable uh, advocate of the, what he called the smelting pot, at some point we lost the S, um, and, uh, and he explicitly actually spoke to um, believing in and even endorsing uh, racial intermixing, and at the time that was um, controversial, to say the least. Um, it, it may be in certain circles even, even today. 
Um, but there really was this commitment, again, to this uh, capacity or this uh, hoped for capacity to rise above uh, racial difference, particularly in terms of discrimination and, and, and hatred. Now, of course, um, this kind of melting pot as, as practiced and applied, uh, yes, did tend to apply to, uh, more to those with European backgrounds. Uh, and they gradually, though not completely, you know, became white. Even Catholics and Jews and Southern Europeans and so on, who previously had not been considered white. So there is a, some of that ideal sort of is mixed, but the melting of the white population into one served also, of course, to distinguish it ever more clearly from the so-called non-white racialized population. Not that racialized communities hadn't already been discriminated against. Um, but I also want to, to signal here that actually this, this goal, this idealism uh, that a civic you know, national identity can transcend the ethnic actually isn't uniquely an American ideal at all. It's the very basic understanding of citizenship and nationalism, right? That, that, and it's really the only thing that puts nationalism in a good light most of the time, that there is this, this idea that you can create a new identity that will supersede Right, not just coexist with, right, but will su supersede all others. That it will replace the hierarchies and the discriminations of race and gender and class and religions with this new political subjectivity of American, of Canadian, but also of British, of German, Italian. Like historically, we've seen this again and again. And the the, the significance of that new identity is that inherently, by this idea of citizenship, everyone is equal. Right? No hierarchies anymore. Each citizen has one vote by virtue of their citizenship. Each person has, uh, each citizen has uh, the same rights before the, before the courts, it's, and so on and so on. Right? That they're not dependent on any other part. Um, but I want to speak to, of course, we've, so we've always had these ideals, and they're not unique to the United States or Canada, and we have always failed to meet them, without exception. Right? It's never been that way in practice. Um, neither has the United States been a perfect melting pot in practice. It has a very violent history of racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, plain anti-immigrant settlement sentiment. It's had segregation, internment, anti-miscegenation laws, riots against marginalized communities, laws against the American born becoming, becoming citizens. And yet, here's, here's the defense. If we go back to um, where these social and cultural ideals try to get pushed into uh, a legal reality and challenge the discrimination that's sort of where the rubber hits the road in some ways. Some interesting things happen. So I want to go back to Plessy versus Ferguson, which is the key Supreme Court decision in the United States uh, that establishes that you can have a separate but equal. Uh, and it's a response to the, to the 14th Amendment. And the decision reads, that look, the object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to endorse social as distinguished from political equality. And it goes on to say, if one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. So you can see what the idealists were up against. But the lone dissenter, and I'm going to, this is important, dissenter part of the decision too, the lone dissenter, which was Justice Harlan at the time, interpreted the 14th Amendment uh, or the Constitution more properly a little bit differently, and he said, our Constitution is colorblind and neither, know, and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. And this kind of language, you know, already in a Supreme Court decision, and this kind of idealism continues to push, and it's quite vivid when, this, when Plessy versus Ferguson is finally overturned in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. And you have the same kind of language around equality that finally kind of breaks through. And it breaks through through the institution, I think, significantly of education, in which the decision, in fact, describes that education is the very foundation of good citizenship. And so it determines that uh, it must be uh, the state's obligation in its provision of public education that, quote, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. So again and again, socially, culturally, and legally, melting in is being used actually in a positive sense in the hopes of trans, like transcending uh, discrimination. To move quickly to Canada, because this is all going to be like a rush through history, 
Um, Canada has actually a similar history in terms of, uh, well, all the same characters, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant sentiment, internment, racism, violence towards immigrants in immigrant neighborhoods, uh, and so on. Now, its articulation of mosaic uh, and multiculturalism actually comes later in its history, though you can find um, evidence of it in, in um, more kind of unofficial social history. Uh, it doesn't, multiculturalism doesn't become an official policy to 1971, but certainly it has a, a deeper history than that. But interestingly, mosaic or multiculturalism is put to work in exactly the same way in Canada, right? To transcend discrimination uh, and hate. And I'm going to jump over sort of the social examples and just move to some, a direct comparison in terms of the legal history uh, and, and cite, uh, and particularly the Zundel decision, R.V. Zundel in 1992. And again, it's not the majority decision, but in the dissent, you start to have an articulation of what multiculturalism means. And uh, Justice Yakabuchi, writing for the dissent, speaks explicitly to Canada's commitments to the values of equality in multiculturalism in uh, sections 15 and 27 uh, of the Charter to speak against uh, the allowance, which the decision was allowing, uh, allowing the publication of uh, what was considered hate material, um, uh, uh, Holocaust denial uh, material. And again, uh, to move forward to the most recent articulation of this in a Supreme Court decision in Canada, which would be just this past February, uh, and interestingly, again, in a, um, an education context, uh, where a, a Quebec couple brought, uh, brought suit arguing that um, they were being exposed to religious diversity uh, in the classroom at too young an age. Um, the decision that basically denied their appeal confirmed from the Supreme Court uh, that the suggestion that exposing children to a variety of religious facts in itself infringes their religious freedom or, or that of their parents um, amounts to a rejection of the quote multicultural reality of Canadian society and ignores the Quebec government's obligations with regard to again public education. So melting pot and mosaic or multiculturalism are not actually that different as put into practice. Now I want to come back around to, okay, but what about identity, right? Did advocating melting pot mean identity was lost, you know, in the United States when actually it was preserved in Canada? And, and the other thing, of course, that it always speaks to, what about the strength of national identity, right? This idea that certainly most Canadians are, I don't know, most, I haven't surveyed them, many Canadians have, right, that, that Canada inherently has a weaker national identity because of, of multiculturalism and the mosaic, right? It's more fragmented, and the United States has got such a strong you know, unif unified identity. But the evidence suggests actually the distinction isn't there. Identity is still fragmented, I'm gonna put that in scare quotes, in the United States as it is in Canada. Um, you, you, uh, and I would say that that's not, not only in terms of religious, uh, ethnic, racial, and so on identities, but also in terms of regional identity, which is not something um, often that Canadians actually recognize uh, about the United States. But also more importantly, the evidence suggests that the so-called fragmentation or a sense of perhaps alienation from a national identity is not due only to the length of time one has been in the country or that one's immigrant status, but also and perhaps more significantly to the presence or experience uh, of racism and discrimination. Because from research that I've done with a colleague uh, here in Toronto, I can tell you that even those born in Canada, and similarly I've seen evidence of those born in the United States who have experienced racism are less inclined to feel part of the national group, Canadian American, even if they're born here. Uh, and in some cases on a par with those who are recent immigrants. That's about the degree of their attachment to that identity. In most cases, the distinctions between the experience uh, both of racialized communities and in sort of a different vein uh, immigrants in Canada the United States and the way that we talk about them in the scholarship is often a case of, of emphasis. Um, with more time I could give you examples of, of books that study sort of the same community in each country and one you know leans one way and one leans the other way in terms of attachment, in terms of fragmentation and so on. But if you look at the details they're not actually that different. You can kind of make the argument uh, either way. 
And I want to emphasize in particular that American national identity is no stronger or, or weaker or more or less unified historically uh, than a Canadian identity. Mosaic and melting pot just don't mark the distinction that many think it does. In practice, not only are they not that different, um, but they're certainly not opposites. Immigration history, in fact, is quite similar uh, in many ways in both countries with, uh, frankly, many embarrassing, shameful uh, examples. But if we wanted to pay attention to big differences around these questions of belonging and identity and discrimination and so on, uh, there are a couple, but they're not related to melting potter or mosaic discourses. Uh, one of the big differences between Canada and the United States is slavery. The impact of an extraordinary the impact and the extent right of an extraordinarily violent institution whose existence it did exist in Canada, but its existence in the United States uh, was much much deeper, much more vast, and much longer. And I would add to that also the the sort of political aftermath up into and in, including uh, the Civil War. But the other one is I, I just have to make one little point about geography. Um, if we take the two. Uh, largest and most significant groups in terms of these studies of, of identity building at the national scale in, in both countries. In the United States it would be African Americans, in Canada it would be uh, French Canadians. The scale of the French presence vis-a-vis -vis the English is much more significant in Canada, historically, uh, than the African American population. Um, not only in terms of, of numbers, because obviously in earlier, and especially in the U.S. South, that the numbers are, are in favor of African Americans in some places, um, but it's also the geographical concentration of the population in Canada. There's, and, and also that there's no equivalent of the Great Migration in Canada, you know, out of Quebec in some kind of, in kind of, some kind of dispersal. And in fact, what you have, you have an overlap of French Canada as a social cultural phenomenon, if you will, and the political jurisdiction of Quebec, which created an entirely different historical and political landscape and outcomes, including in the Constitution. And those are big, significant differences in terms of studying these, these questions of identity and national belonging. So when I started this, I, I started up, uh, honestly, all revved up to, to tear apart the facade of both uh, the melting pot and multiculturalism. Uh, but actually, as I, as I thought about these terms, I, I found myself not exactly becoming friends, but certainly making peace with them as historical objects. And I would hope, actually, that the debate about belonging and citizenship <coughs> might start to turn, actually, around other concepts as well. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Russell Kazal um, of the University of uh, Toronto. Uh, his field is modern U.S. social, urban, and political history. Uh, he's a specialist of immigration, ethnicity, and race, and he's also interested in nationalism and pluralism. Um, his book, Becoming Old Stock, The Paradox of German-American Identity, uh, was published in 2004, and his current research project is entitled The Regional and Immigrant Roots of American Multiculturalism. My goodness. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh, yes. So I'm Russ Cassell. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Toronto. I'm also an American <clears throat> and a somewhat inadvertent immigrant to Canada. Uh, as I tell my students, I am a classic labor migrant. I came here for the job. Uh, but that job at the U of T, and, and specifically uh, my initial appointment ongoing is UT Scarborough, the most immigrant of the three campuses at the U of T. That job has been a real eye-opener, especially when it comes to thinking about pluralism and multiculturalism in a transnational context. For example, when I got here in 2004, one of the first things I learned from my students, and this is in an immigration history seminar, what I learned from them was this. They said to me, you know, Professor, America is a melting pot. Canada is a mosaic. And I was just floored by this statement. I, you know, what I said was, what does that mean? What, what are you talking about in terms of, of you know, what's the comparison you're driving at? Um, it turns out that one of the things they thought it meant was that Canada had something called multiculturalism and the United States did not. And that left me deeply puzzled. This is because my own research focuses on what I see as the rather deep historical roots of American multiculturalism and specifically the ideology of American multiculturalism. In my view, uh, in the US context, multiculturalism has functioned as an ideology. It's a widely held scheme of ideas relating to society that at times justifies particular actions, including state policy. 
And this ideology rests on an affirmation of diversity, that's a key word of multiculturalism, diversity, usually ethno-racial diversity, as a positive good. What I'm interested in doing is historicizing that American ideology, see where it came from, how it developed, how far back it goes. Now, many historians have cast American multiculturalism as fundamentally new, as an ideology that rose to prominence in the 1980s and 1990s. They see it as fueled initially by movements in education, demanding greater attention to the experience of non-Europeans. Uh, then subsequently after that, under the motto of diversity, as an ideology that gained broader support. In this view, the ideology of multiculturalism coalesced in the 1970s and 80s. It broke sharply with previously dominant notions of assimilation. Um, such historians have recognized a precursor ideology in the cultural pluralism advanced during the 1910s by a few intellectuals, notably, no, uh, notably Horace Callan and Randolph Bourne. And, and Callan actually coins the term cultural pluralism in 1924. These historians, though, have seen that cultural pluralism as having a very limited popular reach after the 1910s, and also as Eurocentric and thus sharply distinct from and discontinuous from today's American multiculturalism. Now, this common portrait has its merits. Contemporary multiculturalism in America, I believe, I argue, does enjoy an unprecedented degree of popular support, despite clear countercurrents of nativism and exclusion. In the last decade, though, I think this common portrait of, of American multiculturalism as new has been challenged by a number of historians. At the national level, scholars such as Diana Zalig and Kevin Schultz have located vibrant strands of popular pluralism in American civic culture from the 1920s to the 1950s. Uh, for example, in the interwar cultural gifts movement, what then was called intercultural education. Another set of scholars is focused on a particular regional setting. This is Los Angeles and Southern California. There they've unearthed a range of local pluralist languages and movements dating at least to the 1940s. These emerged under a variety of headings, from the interracialism identified by Daniel Hurwitz to efforts toward intercultural understanding des uh, described by the historian Matt Garcia. These pluralist initiatives of the 1940s and 50s emanated from different sites, left and left liberal political organizations, educational reformers, some liberals in government, and civil rights campaigns by particular ethnic, uh, racial, and sexual communities in LA. But these languages and movements shared some common traits too. In particular, they reflected a notion of pluralism as encompassing multiple groups defined in terms of color. Here they reflected Southern California's extraordinary diversity, encompassing white, black, Mexican, Asian, and American Indian residents. And importantly, these languages and, thought and movements foreshadowed today's multiculturalism by crossing multiple lines of color. And in fact, they may have done more than just foreshadow. My own research now is focusing on whether such Southern California pluralisms fed directly into the multiculturalism of 1980s LA. And there are some tantalizing clues here. Uh, these LA pluralisms were conceptually so close to American multiculturalism today that their bearers at times walked right up to that word. In 1946, for example, activists and educators uh, held a panel in San Diego on intercultural education. They called it Education for Citizenship in a Multi-Culture Society. In 1963, the Chinese-American activist Y.C. Hong told an L.A. audience that, quote, America is a multicultural nation, again with a hyphen. Whether these L.A. pluralisms were precursors of or a direct root of 1980s L.A. multiculturalism, they clearly displayed key elements of the latter. And they did this in terms of breaking cultural pluralism's color line. And I think, in fact, uh, it's possibly the first time that happens in Southern California. It's a model for what you later see in the nation. Um, these pluralisms uh, display key elements in terms of reflecting a variety of messages, some <coughs> radical, some less so, and also in having or aiming to have a transnational reach. Let me, and you know, if you don't believe there is American multiculturalism or pluralism, let me give you a, a literally a concrete example. It involves one of mid-century Los Angeles's leading white, or as they would say there, Anglo liberals, this man, John Anson Ford, and he certainly does look Anglo. Uh, Ford was a long-serving member of the powerful Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. He was also a key figure in a network of interracial and human relations committees and commissions that emerged during the 1940s. And they emerged in response to the explosion of racial conflict in wartime Los Angeles, especially the Zoot Suit Riot. 
These committees were key promoters of the language of interracialism, and they also had multiracial memberships. It's this network uh, that kept Ford in close touch with Mexican American, Japanese American, and African American activists, uh, as well as white liberals committed to civil rights. And you see Ford here, for example, in 1945, with the only black member of the California State Assembly, Augustus Hawkins, Democrat from Los Angeles. Um, Ford knew not just people like Augustus Hawkins, but also key promoters of pluralist notions, including figures such as the journalist and activist Kerry McWilliams and Ignacio Lopez. Um, and Lopez here, a uh, key figure uh, both in Mexican American civil rights activism in the Eastern San Gabriel Valley, and also a promoter of pluralist ideas through his newspaper, El Espectador. If you can see, um, there's a column here, Anessa Sanana, where in fact, Mario um, Garcia, the story was located in a very dis distinct pluralist language. And that's in the late 1940s in LA. Um, it's in this wartime and post-war context that John Anson Ford drew on and shaped a pluralist language of interracialism. As early as 1944, he portrayed LA as a model for democratic, quote, interracial understanding and cooperation. And in the early 1950s, he launched a sustained effort to give that vision concrete shape through the construction of what he called a West Coast companion to the Statue of Liberty, a monument to democracy. This is from a pamphlet Ford publishes privately uh, pushing this effort. What was the monument to democracy? Well, it was supposed to look like this, uh, or actually in, a, in the color rendering of, by the artist Miller Sheets, who, who works with Ford like this. It was to be a 480 foot tall um, monument on a hill in the coastal community of Palos Verdes, overlooking LA Harbor on one side and the newly renamed Los Angeles International Airport on the other. The centerpiece would be at least three massive figures, you can see them here, representing a white man, a black man, and a yellow man, or a white man, brown man, and yellow man, or a white and brown and black man. Ford keeps changing the figures, number of figures and the colors, but there's always a white guy. And they're holding, of course, you know, this is, uh, they're holding a lot of globe, in fact. And part of the point of having this globe up there is it's going to be seen from both the harbor and the new international airport. And you can see that through the location. There's the base of the monument. Um, site of monument, Long Beach and San Pedro Harbors here, and the airport up there. And that's significant for Ford. So John Anson Ford clearly was shooting for something epic when he said, let's build this thing. If, in fact, he had built it, we would all own a tchotchke of it, a souvenir, I think. Uh, Ford comes surprisingly close to pulling this off. He talks then-President Harry Truman into, into agreeing to serve as honorary co-chair of a monument fundraising committee. In 1954, Ford emailed into racialism. That leads me to a final point. Because we need to consider the ways in which ideologies like cultural pluralism and multiculturalism functioned globally, or at least transnationally. In the U.S.-Canada context, that means thinking about cross-border influences on such ideologies in each country. Now, it's easy to see Canadian, a Canadian influence on the U.S. here. Nathan Glazer has suggested that the, that the word multiculturalism was late 20th century import from Canada to the U.S. Question is, did things ever work in the opposite direction? Let me give you one possible example. Uh, oh, by the way, mosaic uh, used in the Canadian context is coined by an American writer in the Prairie Provinces in 1922. Sorry to disappoint, but that's where that word apparently comes from. Um, Victoria Hayward. Uh, but here's my example. Uh, so Canadian Senator Paul Yusick is often credited with an early, maybe the earliest use of the word multiculturalism. Uh, he does this, of course, in the speech in Parliament in 1964, where he refers to the Canadian system of multiculturalism. But if you look at the passage in debates of the Senate where Yusick says this, you, s you can see that he, in fact, is citing the words of an academic. And can you guess where this academic is from? Any thoughts? Los Angeles. Well, actually, Southern California more generally, but he ends up in L.A. Yusick, that is, quoted the words of Professor Charles Hobart, as he says, of California in his speech. Hobart's a newly arrived immigrant to the University of Alberta's sociology department. You know, so I feel for him. I'm kind of the same situation. Yusick, uh, in fact, singles out a 1963 address in Winnipeg where Hobart said, and Yusick quoted, Hobart says the following, quote, you, that is Canada, are almost the multicultural society of the world, and this is your identity. This, 
uh, system of multiculturalism, your system, has now worked for almost 100 years, and you should be missionaries in this type of cause, unquote. Uh, Usyk also quotes Hobart's words on the superiority of Canadian multiculturalism uh, to the American model. Hobart's exact words here are, quote, in the long run, multiculturalism beats the melting pot idea all to hell, unquote, says the American. So who's Charles Hobart? Turns out he was born in China of missionary parents, but he went to college in Southern California. Uh, he earns a BA at the University of Redlands, which is about halfway between uh, LA and Palm Springs in 1950. He gets an MA the next year at the University of Southern California, which of course is in LA. Uh, he taught soci sociology at Redlands from 1954 to 1962. Then he moved on to the University of Alberta. Now Hobart's role as a source for music speech has been noted before. I think what's not been noted, to my knowledge, is Hobart's career in Southern California. Now, this is a research lead I'm trying to follow up, but my research question, or really it's a way of rank speculation, but after all, what are conference papers for? Um, it's this. Did Charles Hobart pick up any of his pluralistic ideas or language from the activist and intellectual milieu of L.A. in the 1940s and 50s? Did notions of L.A. interracialism or, quote, multi-culture, unquote, go with Hobart to Winnipeg? where Paul Yusek could pick them up. Well, for now, I, you know, I simply don't know the answer to that question, though I'm dying to find out. Um, and I have some leads. But I think it's worth considering not only whether mid-century LA's locally generated languages of pluralism fed into today's American multiculturalism, but also whether their global transnational reach ultimately included Canada and Canadian multiculturalism at its birth. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Randy Wittes, who's a professor of uh, geography at the University of Regina. Uh, his interests are in historical geography of Canadian-American borderlands, Canadian migration to the United States, American migration to uh, Canada, and other uh, topics. Uh, he's working on a book uh, project uh, entitled Neighbors in Paradox, the Historical Geography of Canadian-American Borderlands. 1784-1989. Um, he, uh, he had recently published uh, a book called Voices from Next Year Country, an Oral History of Rural Saskatchewan. He's also uh, published with uh, John uh, Bukovic and uh, Nora uh, Fairs, uh, for those of you who uh, know these American historians. So, without further ado. At first glance, the topic, the melting pot versus the mosaic, seems rather straightforward, involving the simple exercise of defining two arguments which for many, particularly Canadians, are framed by what is generally perceived as a basic binary. But nothing could be further from the truth. It's a subject that is hugely complicated, overtly political, and ultimately indeterminate. The idea that there is a single model of acculturation is, is absurd, given the fact that cultures, histories, and indeed geographies are dynamic. And so with this caveat in mind, I will in the brief time allotted present two arguments to, that together serve as some kind of map that guides us through this intellectually challenging exercise. Argument one. As Howard Palmer convincingly argued 36 years ago, the widely held Canadian belief that their immigration policy and social attitudes towards immigrant groups have been and continue to be more liberal and enlightened than those of the United States is at odds with the reality of Canadian history, Canadian immigration policy, and Canadian society. The concept of the melting pot incorporates the idea that immigrants experienced overwhelming assimilative pressures that together broke down and blended together the ethnic and cultural traits from many immigrant source areas into a distinctively American culture. In contrast, the mosaic concept is based on the idea that Canada is a society composed of a, mo of a mosaic of cultures and thusly a mosaic of identities that somehow loosely combine to form a broader national culture. The dominant theme in the mosaic metaphor is multiculturalism, the coexistence of a plurality of cultures, while the dominant theme in the melting pot metaphor is assimilation. There is, as Palmer and others admit, a grain of truth to this distinction, as there have been some key differences between both countries with regard to ethnicity, but it greatly oversimplifies and to some extent falsifies historical reality. For much of history, he argues, Canada and the United States have shared, except for a few notable exceptions, similar immigration histories and policies, nativist and racist attitudes, support of Anglo conformity in Anglo Canada in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and increasing support of cultural pluralism, particularly after World War II. 
The historical evidence, he contends, shows that the melting pot mosaic binary underestimates the degree to which pluralism has been maintained in the U.S. and overestimates the degree to which pluralism has been maintained in Canada among the non-British and non-French groups. Oop, I think I went too fast there. Excuse me. Palmer does acknowledge that there are some key differences, but offers ex explanations as to why such, such discrepancies are more the result of factors other than those that can be related to the binary. For example, he concedes that the existence of French Canada, the rural orientation of Canadian-bound immigrants as opposed to the urban direction among U.S.-bound immigrants during the turn of the, 20, of the 20th century, the relative size differences of various groups going to both countries and the impact of different political systems did give a different face to immigrant experiences in Canada and the United States. But he adds, an investigation into how both societies regarded immigrants and the nature of immigrant life shows that these differences are relatively minor, his words. And even though Canada in the 1920s moved from a model of Asian and Eastern European exclusion that was still followed by the U.S., this change in direction was not the result of a radically changed view of the desirability of such groups, but rather was more the outcome of the country's state of economic development and recognized need for people to settle the West. And although Canada in the 30 years following World War II received roughly half as many immigrants as the United States while having only one-tenth of the population, this was more the result of economic needs than a greater degree of tolerance and humanitarianism. A telling point is the fact that for most of its history, the United States has been more culturally diverse than Canada. And although the percentage of foreign-born persons in Canada has usually been higher than in the United States, as illustrated in this table, this is not an indication of greater cultural diversity, as a larger percentage until the last 40 years or so, a majority of the foreign-born in Canada have been Anglophones from the United Kingdom or the, or the United States. Multiculturalism as a social phenomenon is directly linked to global immigration, and thus both Canada and the U.S. have been multicultural societies for a long time. Palmer draws attention to the fact that even as early as 1976, many Canadians and others were growing dissatisfied with multiculturalism in general, and the Multiculturalism Act, a brand new one in particular. And we have a list here of journalists, Jeffrey Simpson, Andrew, Co Andrew Cohen, novelists, uh, Neil Bazundoff, Kenneth McRoberts, and academics, a list of them there, in Canada and elsewhere, point out that the U.S., like Canada, is also a multicultural society, even though there does, a, does not exist an official government policy like that followed in Canada. Briefly, some of the arguments against multiculturalism presented by these critics include it is leading, leading to ghettoization and cultural balkanization, it is a political ploy to disenfranchise the idea that Quebec is a nation, there remains little measurable evidence that American or Canadian immigrants as collective groups can be proven to be more or less assimilated or multicultural than each other. Multiculturalism has undermined national unity and the goals of multiculturalism to preserve cultures and yet eliminate barriers to mobility are contradictory. In essence, the major criticism of institutionalized multiculturalism is that it has trumped individual rights for collective ethnocultural rights. An institutionalized policy of multiculturalism has now forced the judiciary and the right of law to define culture and identities, making identities a political issue rather than a societal issue, decided and debated in public space with respect to human rights. For many, this has inherent problems. For others, this is a policy that should be adhered to no matter what. Of note is a study by Irene Blomrad, which shows that government funding of ethnic community organizations produces higher citizen, citizenship acquisition rates in Canada compared to the U.S. And then there's, there is the idealist uh, argument focusing on the ideal of creating a utopian, multicultural, and postmodern identity that will somehow allow Canada to, to rise above the issues that nationalism uh, raises. Yet my reading of the literature indicates that in Canada and elsewhere, many no longer believe that multiculturalism is a strategy for immigrant integration. Many of these same critics instead favor the concept of transculturation, which leads me to my second argument. Certainly the postmodern touch is evident in the significant support for transculturalism as a better alternative to multiculturalism. 
The postmodern emphasis on culture and identity has stimulated rethinking about a number of related subjects, including borders, borderlands, transnationalism, multiculturalism, and transculturalism. To some degree, transculturalism has been portrayed as a synthetic alternative located somewhere between the binary opposites of pluralism and assimilation. Unlike multiculturalism, an ideology based on recognition of cultural identities and boundaries acquired throughout what, what was for many a colonial history, transculturalism is based on the breaking down of boundaries and recognition of the other as self. Transculturalism speaks against homogeneity, uniformity, and exclusionary and inclusionary structures and views identity as a fluid concept developed through cross-cultural exchange. In certain ways, transculturalism is analogous to the melting pot because it argues for a process whereby each ethnic immigrant group contributes to a hybrid mainstream culture. But unlike the melting pot, no one culture, theoretically, exerts a hegemonic presence. Proponents argue that transculturalism is liminal because it provides a way for each individual to break beyond the borders of his or her own culture and occupy a hybrid zone of cultural interchange and fluid identification that in turn broadens the field of supracultural creativity. It does not refer to the syncretism of bringing established cultures together, but instead attempts to form a plural unity by triggering the dynamic potential of cultural diversity. Transculturalism lends itself to Homi Baba's concept of the hybrid third space, where a blurring of ethnic and cultural borderlines takes place in an environment of cultural diversity. While many in Canada and the United States support this concept, it has not escaped cr uh, critical scrutiny. Briefly, some of the arguments against transculturalism presented by the critics include, it is the ultimate goal of globalization, and as such can be used as a tool by government and corporate powers to create a hybrid culture which best suits their particular interests. It fails to theorize power relations. It demonstrates a lack of awareness of the social context and discourses that shape social identities and representations. It reduces complex and multiple identities and struggles to a simple and poorly defined hybrid. And it ignores the reality of culture hegemony, whereby certain groups, whether they be nation states or large corporations, determine what the mainstream shall, shall be, while minority groups are forced and or coerced to give up characteristics that define their cultural uniqueness. In my mind, the major criticism of transculturalism transculturalism is that it fails or refuses to recognize the asymmetric power relationships characteristic of, characteristic of regions where cultures come together and as a consequence its major challenge is to address the issue of how to foster heterogeneous interactions and cultural fusion in the face of a society fraught with pervasive inequalities. In response multiculturalists argue that the only proper thing to do to avoid cultural coercion is to allow groups to develop their own mainstream institutions and to exercise cultural hegemony over them. But pluralism, as we have discussed, is also problematic. And so what we're left with is another trap of oppositional discourse. While we're busy wading through this quagmire of concepts and binaries, we must not lose sight of the fact that in both the US and Canada, massive waves of immigration, particularly from outside Europe, have produced some degree of xenophobia and racism in both countries. A November 8, 2010 Angus Reid poll showed that across Canada, 55% of respondents thought multiculturalism had been good for the country, while 30% believed the policy had been bad. British Columbians, at 65%, expressed the highest level of admiration for multiculturalism, while Quebecers, at 49%, were at the bottom end. 65% of respondents aged 18 to 34 thought multiculturalism had been good for Canada, but only 45% of people over the age of 55 concurred. Ironically, 54% believe Canada should be a melting pot, while 33% endorsed the concept of the mosaic. There's a confusion here, folks. The melting pot idea was particularly attractive for Quebecers at 64%, Albertans at 60%, and respondents over the age of 55. The mosaic received its best marks among British Columbians at 42%, and respondents age 18 to 34. Some concluding thoughts, and Patricia, some geography here. <laughs> Culture is meaningless without a corresponding geography. It is always placed and situated in time and space and at a specific scale. 
For example, it might be shown that multiculturalism has made some cities more diverse and interesting, while for others it has led to divisions and racial conflict. More likely, it has produced both. Immigrant settlement is often highly concentrated in select regions and cities, and it is in these places that immigration politics is most contentious. The concentrated geography of immigrants in both the U.S. and Canada intersects with a federalized system for dispersing welfare and other social costs of immigration. Yet while federal governments may pursue either officially or unofficially policies of cultural integration, it is at the sub-national levels, the provinces and states and the municipalities where education is determined that the battleground of competing ideologies and resultant policies is really carried out. This creates tension between a central government with the responsibility for controlling the mission and state, provincial, local governments who pay the social costs of immigrant incorporation. This dynamic of conflict has been exacerbated in recent years by the neoliberal governance strategy of downloading. In the US, Canada, Australia and several European countries, the promotion of assimilation in the sense of a renewed defense of liberalism is becoming more apparent. Although these transformations play out quite differently in different national settings, there is a familiarity to much of the state-based rhetoric, which increasingly emphasizes the choice of individual immigrants or minorities to assimilate to the values of liberalism and hence attain civil competence, while many of the social services which had formerly aided them in doing so are being removed, subcontracted, or devolved to the community level. I'll leave you to ponder one of my favorite movie quotes, one I think is relevant in this context, from The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962, directed by John Ford, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. What do you think about that? Our uh, final speaker this afternoon is uh, David Atkinson, who is an assistant professor in the history department at Purdue University. Um, his specialization is U.S. foreign re relations, with particular emphasis on uh, new cultural, international, and transnational approaches. He's working on a, a book project, in fact, uh, on uh, the relationship between uh, culture and power in American foreign relations during the Cold War. Um, he's currently revising his uh, doctoral dissertation entitled The Burdens of Whiteness, Asian Immigration, Restriction, and White Supremacy in the British Empire and the United States, 1897-1924. Well, one of the great advantages of going last on a five-person panel is that everybody's already said everything you wanted to say, much more eloquently and much more emphatically. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to just start again by thanking Ben and Roberto and Alexander and everybody else who's been involved in this workshop. It's been a, a great day so far and uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to talk today solely about uh, the melting pot in American history. And I want to address two specific things, and I'll do so very briefly, don't worry. First of all, I want to briefly outline the melting pot idea and suggest some of the ways in which uh, it's been used throughout American history with a specific emphasis on nation building. That's uh, going to be my emphasis as far as the melting pot is concerned. And why historians have come to regard it as a myth, of course, as many other people have, have spoken about. And then I want to highlight some of the ways in which Americans have challenged the melting pot myth in American history. And I want to go back to 1916 and talk a little bit about Randolph Bourne, who was mentioned as well, who comes up with this idea of a transnationality or a transnational America. And I think that speaks uh, to a lot of what a lot of us are thinking about this, uh, this weekend. So... I'm going to go even further back than anyone else has gone yet when I talk about the origins of the melting pot. And I'm going to start with a French immigrant named Hector Saint-Jean de Clavacor in 1782. He published what became a foundational text in American history called Letters from an American Farmer. And in this tract, de Crevacor has this famous explanation of one of the first really iterations of America as a melting pot. And he says in, in this tract, what then is the American, this new man? He is an American who, leaving behind him all his ancient prejudices and manners, receives new ones from the new mode of life he has embraced, the government he obeys, and the new rank he holds. Here, individuals of all nations are melted into a new race of men, whose labors and posterity will one day cause great changes in the world. 
De Crevacor's new man was, of course, reinvigorated, as we know, by uh, a British playwright called Israel Zangwill in 1908 with his play, which you've heard about, The Melting Pot. Um, I just want to quote the, the key line from The Melting Pot uh, at, right at the end where he is saluting the, the Statue of Liberty to celebrate the fact that his symphony will, in fact, you know, uh, transcend the terrible horrors of his own life. And the quote here, I think, that's operative is, There she lies, the great melting pot. Listen, can you hear the roaring and the bubbling? There gapes her mouth, the harbour where a thousand mammoth feeders come from the ends of the world to pour in their human freight. Ah, what a stirring and a seething. Celt and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian, black and yellow. Yes, east and west and north and south. How the great alchemist melts and fuses them with his purging flame. How the great alchemist, by the way, went from being a woman in the Statue of Liberty to becoming a man with his purging flame, I don't know, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. These examples, I think, illustrate the deceptively simple and enduring explanatory power of the melting pot myth, in which immigrants almost passively shed their old identities and cultures and are then assimilated also somewhat passively as Americans. It was, of course, much more complicated than that, as we've already heard. Approximately uh, 28 million immigrants entered the United States between the publication of de Crevacor's letter and the debut of Zangwill's play. The 19th century, as most of us already know, was a century of global mobility. And it was also a century of nation building, in which Americans and others created, fought over, and reformed the institutions of the nation state. And I would like to suggest, as others have, that migration and nation-building nation were inextricably linked. The American nation-state was built upon migration, both volunteer and, of course, forced. Industrialization relied, relied upon uh, immigrant labor, as did agriculture, as did resource extraction. In this respect, the melting pot represents a constituent feature of nation-building, often referred to as Americanization a useful tool that Americans could use to convince themselves that these millions of immigrants would become like them. Put simply, I think, the melting pot was a way to reconcile migration and nationalism. And I want to suggest also that this is, this is only one of three different Americanization processes that are taking place at this time, and I'm thinking about how to link them. I've come to no conclusion so far, so this is as far as I'll go. But in the late 19th, early 20th century, you have this Americanization project that is trying to Americanize immigrants. You also have an Americanization project, a nation-building project, that is trying to reconcile Northerners and Southerners to try and overcome uh, the Civil War and the scars that that had left. And I think you also have a third Americanization project going on globally, which is the United States is reaching out into the world and en enhancing its, uh, its commercial influence globally. So I think I want to th think about, and again I'll throw this out to you guys because you're all intelligent people far more than I am, that we really have three Americanizations taking place and they're, they're related, they're related through nation building, but I suspect there's more to that story than, than uh, that simple um, statement suggests. Now, of course, the melting pot metaphor has never truly reflected or explained the immigrant experience. The melting pot is a myth because it tells us less about the experience of individual immigrants or even immigrant groups and more about the anxieties, expectations and desires of the native-born population. The melting pot was most often seen as something that Americans did to immigrants, not something that immigrants may or may not have done to themselves, either in partnership with or in spite of their new neighbours. And where de Crevacor imagined that immigrants were leaving behind all their ancient prejudices and manners, we know that immigrants rarely shed their cultures or ties to their homelands entirely. And where Zangwill imagined that the melting pot welcomed Celt and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian, black and yellow, we know, as Zangwill's contemporaries most assuredly did, that Slavs, Asians, Africans and others were neither fused nor even welcome in the American melting pot. In fact, the American melting pot reached its most searing and oppressive temperatures during times of crisis and war. And it was during times of crisis that the melting pot was at its most exclusionary and discriminating, as the period around the First World War vividly demonstrates. 
The war and its aftermath represent a high point of exclusion and nativism, with new restrictions placed on Asians and Southern and Eastern Europeans between 1917 and 1924. And here again, migration and nation building were inextricably linked, as Americans defined the boundaries of who could and who could not be part of the American nation, determining that many prospective immigrants could no longer be blithely expected to assimilate, whether for racial, political, or religious reasons. Nevertheless, somewhat ironically, it's also during the First World War that Americans begin to develop sustained, vigorous, and intellectually compelling uh, challenges to the melting pot myth. Horace Callan, as we've already heard, fired one of the first volleys in this when he writes an essay in 1915 called Democracy versus the Melting Pot, in which he begins to articulate this idea of cultural pluralism. <clears throat> Another American intellectual at this time, however, offers something I think quite new and quite different. Randolph Bourne rejected both the cultural rigidity of, cult of cultural pluralism and the cultural effacement of assimilation. He instead proposed the notion of a transnational America in 1916. Bourne recognized the long-standing propensity of immigrants to preserve and maintain their own cultures, which he saw as an eminently positive and eminently American desire. He chided the intolerant Americanizers, who were at once completely confident in the superiority of their institutions and their culture, and yet simultaneously terrified by the prospect of immigrant cultures infecting and destroying those institutions and that culture. To be sure, Bourne occasionally lapsed into some of the same cultural and racial stereotypes that plagued his contemporaries, but he nevertheless pointed towards a new American identity, one rooted in cosmopolitanism, cultural fusion, and ultimately globalism. In his words, America is coming to be not a nationality, but a transnationality, a weaving back and forth with the other lands of many threads of all sizes and colors. Rather than a homogeneous Anglo-dominated nationalism, Bourne advocated her a heterogeneous cosmopolitan transnationalism, one that saw cultural diversity as a source of strength rather than weakness. In many ways, Bourne was advocating for a new melting pot, one that did not simply dilute cultural distinctions into the tasteless, colorless fluid of uniformity that represented the dominant Anglo-Saxon culture, whatever that meant, but rather one that privileged a federation of cultures. It was a melting pot, and I think this is important in thinking about Bourne, it was a melting pot into which everybody continually climbed. Not just new immigrants, but Americans as well. In Bourne's estimation, assimilation was a reciprocal process in which immigrants and Americans absorbed one another's cultures, incessantly creating something new and entirely transnational. I think Bourne's notion of transnational America offers an intriguing way to think beyond the melting pot and the mosaic. It suggests how both immigrants and Americans were engaged in a mutual process of Americanization, a process that was not static, unilateral, or hermetically sealed within the United States borders, but rather dynamic, collaborative, and expansive. It offers us a way to keep exploring the cracks both within and between the melting pot and the cultural mosaic, and it indeed allows us to continue transcending this mythical binary and to keep transcending the artificial boundaries of the nation state. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a recording of The Mosaic versus the Melting Pot, Myths and Realities of Cultural Pluralism in Canada and the United States, a roundtable that took place on October 19, 2012, as part of the Borderlands Workshop at Glendon College in Toronto. You can find recordings of other talks on activehistory.ca.